some months ago, a friend invited me to the Singapore hacker space and said, can you come and read some poetry there? And she said, we've got an astronomer coming to join us. Just come and read some poems after that. We thought we'd have the both of you for contrast. So I show up with a few sheets of paper because my life is analog that way and maybe a couple of poems on my iPad, and I find out that I'm reading after the director of astrovisualization at the American Natural History Museum, who proceeds to show the entire audience a 3D model of the universe. <laughs> what do you do, right? You cannot possibly come, do anything to come after that. And I thought that the best thing to, to do today would be to talk about something that is deeply personal for me, and that's poetry. Poetry is something that I've felt in my blood, in my mind, in my heart for the longest time. It's as much a part of me as anything else, and it's been a part of me for as long as I can remember remembering. And when I first joined public policy as a career, that's not strictly politics, I'm a civil servant, so I serve the government of the day, one of the most frequent questions asked to me was the one you see on this slide. What's a person like you doing in a place like this? You don't really belong here, do you? You people who think in myths and metaphors. You don't write boring papers with numbered paragraphs and lots of bullet points. And for the longest time, I did think that poetry and policy, like several other things in our lives, don't mix, whether it was oil and water or east and west. And I wanted to share with you today three phases of the journey that I've taken with poetry and policy because both have been inextricable parts of my life. The first phase was what I like to call the separation of, of poetry and policy. And this was where I thought, well, I'll go to work, and from 9 till 5, or on some days 9 till 8, or 9 or 10, I will be a policymaker. And when I have time, early in the mornings, late at night, 3 a.m., when I get woken up with inspiration, I will write poetry. And for a long time, this was the kind of poetry that I managed to do. This is the cover of um, A-List magazine, which was very kind in quoting one part of a poem that I wrote called Momentarily, where I described how there were moments momentarily momentous in our lives. And those are the moments that are actually separated from the humdrum of routines that are not quite part of the daily realities that we go through. And I started with the idea that the day was yawning itself awake. And this was one of those days when maybe the rush could wait for a while and we wouldn't have to get involved in that routine immediately. I found that my poetry was in a lot of ways very deeply personal and sometimes about a past that I couldn't always remember. But that was there nonetheless, wordless and formless, but part of that ineluctable memory that was my life. The picture you see here is the house that I was born in on a little road called Edgware Road, in Jalan Kayu, which is very close to an old British camp. My parents rented that house for $99 a month back in the late 1970s. And I have vague impressions of that house, although I didn't spend more than the first year of my life there. I remember memories that sometimes simmer into reality. And I remember asking myself, can thoughts think? And if they could, would they choose to wander like this in the morning at memory's border? I eventually used that phrase, Morning at Memory's Border, for the first book of poetry that I published. And I asked myself, if thoughts rise above recollection and remembrance, can they also somehow avoid being forgotten? Can be, they be that part of our timeless life that we never actually lose them? Gradually, though, I realized that to separate poetry and public policy was not going to be tenable, because both were such deep parts of my daily existence and of the life that I was trying to live. And so at that point, poetry started to become what I call a survival mechanism. It helped me to not just separate parts of my life, but to live through the madness and the rush of work, because it provided me with moments of reflection and moments of silence. And perhaps one of the poems where I capture this most satisfactorily for myself was a poem that I wrote about being in Petra the great pink rock city in Jordan. And I started that poem by saying that here I learned that even stone has its language. Standing here where rarefied mountain air slices bone and evaporates the need for words except the toughest, most spare. I realized from being in Petra, 
that sometimes we need to find those moments of silence. And poetry was a way of giving me that silence outside the realm of public policy. And the last few lines of this poem, I think, capture, I think, quite how the survival mechanism actually works. Because in otherworldly silence, there is sometimes a whisper of what we seek. When freed of the world's static, God's word grows loud and the silences begin to speak. But even that wasn't quite enough, because I realized that that was still imposing some kind of separation between the worlds of poetry and policy. And more lately, perhaps coming with age, perhaps because there is greater maturity now, I've realized that there can actually be synthesis between these two worlds, these worlds that for so long felt estranged and separated. And I've realized that there can be poetry in policy if we know where to look. Because poetry is all about a sense of mission, about having deep promises to keep to ourselves, to the people we serve, to the publics that count on us to do a job and do it well. And that sounds very much like the promises to keep that Robert Frost talks about in his renowned poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Poetry is also there in motivational power. This is an English translation of Rabindranath Tagore's poem, Walk Alone, translated by Indira Gandhi, because she found that none of the other English translations were satisfactory for her. And I love this because it reminds me that in crisis, and there are many crises in public policy, when we're dealing with situations where there isn't enough time, where there isn't enough space, where there aren't enough resources, if no one listens to your call, if people fear and they cower, then we can walk alone. And sometimes that is the path of the policymaker, to strike out, to be a pathfinder, and not necessarily have lots of company along the way. We must find the courage to ignite our hearts with the lightning and the pain, and ourselves become a guiding light. I think poetry is there in how the past pollinates the present, because so often we look for new things to do. We're asked by the masters that we serve, by the publics that we serve, to find new solutions for the worlds out there. And then we realize that actually the solutions that we were looking for have been staring at us all the time. Because when we cease from exploration, when we get to the end of all our exploring, we find that we arrive where we started and we know that place for the first time. As T.S. Eliot tells us in this, these wonderful lines, which I think are amongst the most beautiful in the English language, from his poem, Little Gidding in the Four Quartets. And sometimes, poetry is there in the complexity and the difficulty of the work. Because very often in public policy, we are asked to be firm and kind at the same time. We have to be fast, but we have to move in a measured and deliberate way. We have to cater to everyone, but we need to be customized and specific and particular at the same time. And I feel very often that I'm being asked to contradict myself. And I found deep comfort in the lines of Walt Whitman's song of myself when he says, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. But I am large. I contain multitudes. Poetry helps us, I think, to find those multitudes and to grow and to be large with the kind of growth mindsets that people earlier in this conference have actually talked about. And what I realized over time, over the three phases of moving from separation to survival to synthesis, is that there have been others along the way who have fought a similar fight. The poets and the policymakers and those involved in politics in some way who are trying to find ways to let words shape their lives and let their lives shape their words. Poets were, after all, amongst the first makers that we all knew. They sang societies into being and they gave nations their names. Like the poets you see here, who are also deeply involved in the politics and the policies of their own countries. I hope that all of you will be able to find your own poem, whether it's one poem or many, because those poems, when infused into the life that you lead, whether it's a life of policy or anything else, can be a source of synthesis, of congruence, and hopefully, of wholeness. Thank you.